Okay, so today what we are going to do is look at compiler optimizations because we are getting to the stage where from now onwards what we'll be doing is just looking at the use of the Vivado HLS tool to generate certain kinds of optimized code, generate netlists that can then be integrated with the hardware. So as I had sent out in the email, the goal is that today and tomorrow for sure and uh, possibly Friday if required, uh, I'll be going over first compiler optimizations in general and then diving deeper into the specifics of the Vivado HLS tool, right? So what we are going to do is try and understand some of the directives that can be applied using Vivado HLS, what kind of impacts they have. We will start with the FFT code itself that I showed you and essentially we'll see how to bring down the latency, how to bring down the initiation interval for that design from the I think roughly 1600 or so that we started with and bring it down to a much smaller level right and similarly we'll also take up another example from the book that I had uh, uh, mentioned earlier this is the parallel programming for FPGAs the open source book which is available online okay uh, it's been linked to through the Moodle website you can go through that as well uh, I will also circulate the code that I'll be using for that uh, demo so you can go through it on your own and also try those things out and I would strongly suggest you do that. Uh, the other thing is we are pretty much at the last part of the course. There is, There are a couple of lectures I need to take to bring up a few more topics, uh, some issues related to DSP uh, uh, system implementation but for the most part we are done with the primary background. So from now onwards, the main focus is going to be on the project. There will also be a couple of assignments, which are more sort of routine assignments in the sense that we'll be working through them in detail and then you have to complete them essentially, right? But what is required is that as of Monday, you should at least have a baseline working code for the projects that you're going to take up so that uh, we can basically spend time during the class hours going through the uh, those material and essentially working on how your project can be defined. So I'm planning to work with each group to some extent look at what your designs are and see how they can be modified and improved moving forward. Okay, so uh, in other words by Monday please make sure that you have a basic reference code already in place and during next week I will announce when we will be having lectures here and the other parts will be in, probably in the IE lab. We need to confirm that, I'll send that separately. Uh, Alright, so now let's get to the topic for today's class which is basically compiler optimizations. So to understand what we mean by compiler optimizations, first we need to know what we mean by compilation. Okay, And one definition of a compiler is a computer program that transforms code written in one programming language into another programming language. Okay, This is a very generic broad definition and is I think a good definition for our working purposes because it conveys a lot of useful information. First is there is a program that you have to deal with. Somebody has written this program and you are going to be using this compiler. But the important part is what does it do? It takes code that has been written in one programming language and converts it into another programming language. Okay, That's what a normal compiler does. It would take something like the C code that you write and convert it into the machine code that can run on a processor. It becomes an executable file. So there it's sort of easier to understand what it means by take one programming language that is C and convert it into another one which is machine code because we still think of machine code as a programming language. But what we are interested in is creating hardware. Okay, Which is why it makes sense to think of hardware as something that can itself be described by means of a programming language. Of course, we know what the language is. In our case, we are probably going to use Verilog. But the idea is that, you know, anything that can be put down into a systematic set of instructions or steps is all that we mean when we talk about a programming language, right? So with that in mind, this definition is very broad, of course, but is also, you know, it conveys the right uh, meaning for the way that we are going to use it. Input, of course, for a compiler could be a number of different types of languages, any programming language that we are typically familiar with. C is probably the first language that we come across which requires compilation or Java depending on whether you did that C or Java in school, C, C++ or Java in school, right? Uh, 
Python is a slightly different beast. Python is one of a class of languages called interpreted languages, right? MATLAB, Python, Perl, uh, Ruby, a whole bunch of different languages fall in this category. Now, even though they are interpreted, at the end of the day, what is still happening is that you are writing code in one language and underlying it, there is some conversion to another language or another set of instructions that can execute on the processor. So even though it's called an interpreter because of the nature of how it runs, the fact is that it is still doing the same thing. It is converting code in one language to another language. Okay, So there is some compilation involved even in Python. Of course, the point is, instead of any of these languages, you could also have a hardware description language, Verilog or VHDL being the most common ones. Or as we are seeing in this course, you can take C and treat it as a hardware description language in some ways. Okay, So what's the output? Once again, it is a programming language. The usual common outputs, one is the machine code of the processor, which is the most common case. The second is intermediate byte code. This is, for example, what is generated by Java, right? Java generates something called a byte code, which is then run through the Java virtual machine and is actually executed, right? That's somewhere in between the actual machine language of the processor and a high level language like C or Java. Or the third kind of output could be a gate level netlist, right? Which is what finally we are interested in. What I'm leaving unsaid over here is the fact that you could also have something which takes input in C and outputs Java. That's also a compiler, right? But those are rare. They are not really very useful in most cases. So what's the compilation process? Again, this is something that you probably should have some familiarity with. If some of you have taken a course in the computer science department, then you, know, you would probably have gone through the entire process of building a compiler. If not, then at least the basic stages are something that you need to be aware of, right? Broadly, you can split it into three parts, the front end, the middle portion, and the back end, okay? Very innovative names, but whatever. The front end, all that it does is take your input, the C or HDL code. The first step is something called parsing, right? So All right, so the parser what it does is <coughs> splits the input into so called tokens, right? So tokens are essentially parts of your programming language, which essentially correspond to keywords or structure. So for example, when I write a line like for i is equal to zero, i less than n, i plus plus, for is one token. It's a keyword, which is understood by the C programming language. The parentheses are also tokens. i is a token which is translated as a variable. The equal sign is a token which is translated as an initialization. The zero is a token which is translated as the value to initialize and so on okay next we come to grammar analysis right which is the so called syntax checking which essentially says is this a meaningful sentence in this language that you have written okay once both of these have passed that is to say you are able to recognize this as a language as a program that has been written in c and it is valid c there is no syntax error that has been detected what the front end does is generate something called an intermediate representation, an IR. Okay, There are many different kinds of intermediate representation. If you look at them, ultimately they will resemble to a large extent the assembly language that you might be familiar with from a basic course on microprocessors. Okay? They resemble that, but they are not exactly that for one simple reason. 
right now you still don't know which processor you are going to run on you don't care right this is still generic it's independent of the processor target or the actual whether it's going to be a processor or whether it's going to be hardware the middle portion is the one that does a lot of the different kinds of optimizations on the code right it basically takes the intermediate representation that has been generated and modifies it in various ways right what are those modifications we will look at many of the modifications of course we will not be looking at ir we will not be looking at intermediate representations because that's generally hard to understand so i'll be explaining all the optimizations with regard to a generic c type of language but the meaning and how it applies to the case of uh, intermediate representation should be fairly clear the back end does something called code generation right in the case of a c compiler c to uh, a compiler that's going to run on a uh, processor it will generate the output executable files right so the elf file that i used in order to demonstrate the fft code running on the uh, system that elf file is essentially something that is created by the c compiler for the arm processor and essentially consists of a set of machine instructions similarly vivado hls generates a different kind of code it doesn't generate machine instructions it generates netlist in the form of verilog code synthesizable verilog code okay at this point a lot of a few more optimizations are done which are target dependent because the back end is something that is generating code for a very specific target which means that for example if i know that i am targeting a processor that has two multipliers i can do certain kinds of optimizations that may not otherwise be possible for on a processor that does not have two hardware multiplication units okay now one thing to keep in mind even the so called target independent optimizations many of them as we'll see later they make certain assumptions on the general type of target that we are going to be aiming for right in particular they will make certain they some of the optimizations work only if you have a certain type of memory layout if you have a certain cache structure if you have a certain basic alu behavior some number of registers and you know the fact that the number of registers is at least so much or at least one hardware multiplier is present those kind of things change the kind of even the target independent optimizations that we can talk about there are a few general guidelines that are applied across compilers the one of the most obvious ones when you think about it but a lot of people what and the reason why i am putting these guidelines over here is very often i find that people try to start optimizing code they write code and then they start making optimizations one of the things that you need to understand properly is how good is your compiler the compiler that you are going to use do you really need to write the optimizations on your own or can you rely on the compiler to apply them properly for you right and more to the point if you try to apply the optimizations by yourself are you in some cases actually preventing the compiler from exploring more options and possibly coming up with something even better than you thought of okay in general of course these are more generic guidelines the first and foremost is optimize the so called common case what do i mean by the common case what we are talking about over here is there is a certain uh kind of uh, a set of paths through the program right typically there will be some for loops as well as other instructions that are being executed some of them are common they are executed a large number of times whereas there are others that are only going to be executed a small number of times but might consist of a large block of code okay does it make sense to optimize those the ones that are not going to be commonly executed or does it make sense to optimize only the ones that are commonly executed okay uh, i need to take a small break here and make sure i can get this pen functional again
hopefully we are back on track now let me just yeah that looks better so optimize the common case essentially what it's saying is if you are starting from some part of the program it then has to run through multiple things and there is some loop over here that is going to run many times and there are you know other things over there that are going to run only for a small amount of time right what you need to do is actually measure the total time that is going to be taken by this and find the part which is occupying the maximum amount of time and see whether you can reduce that okay if you can reduce this part of the program then it actually makes sense because after that whatever you have even if this remains exactly how the same as what it was earlier what you end up with is shorter runtime right there is in fact a way of phrasing this it's called amdahl's law or this is one possible way of interpreting something called amdahl's law right which essentially says the amdahl's law is slightly different but what it says is if you have a program that takes some x amount of time and you are able to accelerate some part of it even if you can get infinite acceleration on some part of it you are still limit, limited by what remains okay so of course if you go and concentrate on a part that takes a very small amount of time to start with then the overall benefit that you get as far as the program is concerned is very small okay now the next set of steps avoid redundancy this seems like general good common sense right you don't want to have redundant code the same code happening again and again why am i putting this exception over here because there are cases where it makes sense to recompute things right it might actually be faster for you to recompute certain values or to redo a certain part of the code rather than trying to optimize it and make it some efficient function call which has a high overhead associated with it because of the way that it gets called okay same story for less code you might find that you know if i can create a few functions and call them repeatedly that everything is great but there can be situations where actually expanding out the code and writing it out more explicitly rather than trying to make it more compact can make it actually easier and faster for the computer to execute we'll actually see a, some examples of that going forward but in general those are the exceptions as a general rule less code is good one important thing which again is related to what i said about you know the compiler independent things still needing or rather target independent things still needing to know something about the target is this thing which says you need to be aware of what your memory layout looks like more than the memory layout what i mean is the cache structure right so typically what happens is you have some large amount of dram a small l3 cache an even smaller l2 cache and a really tiny l1 cache why i'm saying tiny is this could be gigabytes this could be tens of megabytes this would be 1 to 2 megabytes and this would be kilobytes in a typical processor the speed with which you can access data written into those uh, blocks of memory is inversely proportional to the size of the memory right so the smaller ones can be accessed faster in general this actually makes a significant difference to how efficient your program becomes so you need to be aware of that when you are doing compilation there is finally this concept of parallelism which once again we'll need to understand quite well because in our case parallelism is even more of a concern than for general compilers that target cpus because in cpus at most you have like you know a very limited amount of parallelism because your processing units are quite less whereas in hardware potentially you can create as much parallelism as you want okay how do you make use of that of course it's a trade off because the more parallelism that you have more hardware that you are using or more instructions are being used in software at the same time one very important requirement is that as far as possible your optimizations should be guided by profiling okay what i mean by profiling is you what i showed you the other day in the case of the fft demo you can actually put some kind of counters and indicate or and sort of estimate how much time is taken by any given function 
once you have identified that your function is actually a bottleneck in some way then yes it makes sense to go in and try to optimize it okay but unless you do this kind of profile guided optimization most compilers by their nature don't do that the compiler optimizations that we are going to talk about are not going to be doing this right they just have some general guidelines on what kind of optimizations can be applied and they'll try to apply them in any way possible but when you are trying to make further improvements upon the code you should actually target the functions or the areas of your code that are actually slow and take a large amount of time okay warning premature optimization right invariably in fact it's very likely that you yourself are going to want to do this in the sense that the moment you see the code you immediately think okay yeah i can apply this kind of either pipelining over here or this kind of unrolling over here right or do some other kind of optimization with some variables that i have do not do any such thing until you understand the impact on the entire program or the entire system that you are going to implement because very often what happens is you think that you are modifying your code in a certain way to improve it that unfortunately ends up making it harder for the compiler to apply other kinds of optimizations that it could have and by applying certain optimizations early on in the process you might be preventing certain things that could be done later okay so you should always keep that in mind you need to actually understand the big picture what is your overall code getting translated into before you start applying any optimizations so now we are going to dive into a bunch of different optimizations try and understand these again anybody who's skimmed through a course on compilers this will all be old hat but i'm just going to go through it anyway right some of many of these optimizations as you will see are obvious and intuitive but the point is again it's not that you want a human being to actually be doing all of them a compiler a, a program should be able to do them automatically right so many of them have been designed with that in mind and that's why some things that you would think are very obvious are still put down as being a big deal okay this is an example right supposing you have a code where you say x is equal to 3 plus 5 right there are two parts to how a program gets executed the first is the compile time the second is the run time right compile time happens typically only once run time for most programs happens many times you are going to run the same program many times after compiling it okay in the case of hardware once you have created the hardware you will then use it a large number of times but the compilation process happens only once so typically what is considered a good idea is spend more time during compilation but reduce the run time this is an example where you can do that right x is equal to 3 plus 5 why should i do this at run time i don't need to actually do an addition at run time i can straight away replace this instruction with x is equal to 8 at compilation time so the first question you might ask is why would i ever write code like this 3 plus 5 ideally you shouldn't but what if 5 was a macro some kind of a hash define that you did not actually know while writing your code or at least you wanted to keep it in such a way that it could be modified by someone if required right let's say that you are trying to put together the size of the frame required for a communication packet it consists of many components one of them is a preamble size some number of symbols to be sent out as pilots the number of symbols that are incorporated in one packet of data and the number of packets themselves okay now you are not going to be changing those at run time but you do want the flexibility of being able to change them at least at compilation time to target a different piece of hardware okay which means the compiler can then reduce all of that to a single number and use it from there onwards this simple fairly obvious thing is called constant folding okay uh offshoot of that is what we would call constant propagation here what i can do is i can now replace x because i know that when i reach this instruction y is equal to x plus 4 because of the way that instructions are executed right the semantics of the c programming language y is equal to x plus 4 is going to be executed immediately after x is equal to 3 plus 
which means when I reach y is equal to x plus 4, x must have the value 3 plus 5, that is 8. Okay, so I can propagate this value in here, 8, and then again do a constant folding and finally end up with y is equal to 12. And straight away done. So this is propagate, then fold. Okay, like I said, fairly intuitive and obvious. The good thing about it is this can be done automatically by compilers. It's not something that you need to sit around you know, doing manually. So in other words, the point over here that I'm trying to make is, do not try to do these kind of optimizations on your own. Use macros, use hash defines wherever possible so that you can change things in one place and have it reflect throughout your code, right? The compiler will be able to take care of all of those and replace them with appropriate constants. On the other hand, if this was something like, you know, instead of three plus five, if this was two variables and they were assigned values, that makes it a bit more tricky because then the compiler cannot easily tell that they are not going to change their value and it cannot replace them with constants, not always at least. There is a sort of, you know, growing from there, the next thing that we can come up with is this idea of common sub expression elimination. A good example of that would be something like what we see over here. Right? Again, something which could easily come up in a communication system. What's the common sub-expression? Right? This part over here. 2 pi f c n. Right? Strictly speaking, this first portion, this is actually constant folding. Right? But what is more important after that is the fact that I can then use that folded constant depending on whether fc was a hash define or a variable, right? Now I would get different values. If fc was a variable, this now is no longer a constant, but is something that I can compute ahead of time, right? I can basically call it wc or something like that, omega c. Right? In which case I could then write it as cos of wc into n sine of wc into n. In fact, I can go one step further and basically say that this itself is a common sub expression and call this as some <coughs> tn is equal to wc into n so that I basically guess cos of tn sine of tn. Right? Why look at it in two stages like this? Because if the code that I was actually dealing with was something like this, for i is equal to 1 to 1000, y of i equals uh, x of i into cos of 2 pi f i plus z of i into sine of 2 pi f i, right? This 2 pi f is a constant independent of the loop. But 2 pi f i is constant only for this expression. Okay? So I could do it in two steps like this. I could basically create one constant k1 equals 2 pi f and then do k2 equals k1 into i and replace this with y of i equals x of i into <coughs> cos of k1 plus z of i into sin of k1 sorry k2 right so you see what's happening over here i if I had not done this step, k1 equals 2 pi f, I would then still have to do 2 into pi into f over here, which would happen a thousand times inside the loop, unnecessary multiplication. Okay, I can replace that with one multiplication which goes outside and then do it internally. Okay, so this idea of finding common sub expressions 
is a very powerful optimization. Again, it is something that compilers are usually quite good at. Okay, many of these cases, is, uh, the compiler would do a fairly good job of finding all those common cases and removing them. Having said that, you will find while going through the synthesis process in Vivado that there can be cases where by keeping this in mind that you can actually reduce certain computations, you might find that you are actually able to get better performance if you rewrite your code to do some kind of elimination in this way. Okay. Now one interesting thing, it's called dead code elimination. Okay. So let's look at this piece of code and find out what the different instructions are finally going to do. I want to find out which are the instructions over here that have no impact whatsoever on the final output. Okay, So as I go through the compiler, let's look at this one first. It's just a declaration. I can't really say anything about it. Next instruction i is equal to 1. Then j is equal to 2. Now i is equal to 3, which basically means that any previous assignment to i is redundant. So I can go back and mark this as dead code. Okay. Next instruction j is equal to i plus 4 overwrites the previous assignment to j which was 2. That is also dead code. Okay. Return i. At this point what happens? The assignment to j also becomes dead. Because I am not using it. What about the instructions after that? Not reachable. Okay. So this code could easily have been, I could also have in, in other words completely eliminated j itself, the declaration of j. So I could have converted this to just int i, i is equal to 3, return i, which if I do some constant propagation basically just converts into one step return 3. Right. So the most obvious question that comes up when I show you a piece of code like this is why would anyone ever write code like this? And yes, the answer is you are not likely to. Okay. But it can come up as a result of certain other kinds of optimizations that the compiler has applied. Okay. So what happens is some optimizations, some kind of constant propagation, some movement of code around and so on can result in a case where some code that you have written actually can be eliminated as dead code. An extreme example of that, which is something that you might very well encounter if you try doing something like, you know, writing a small piece of code to find out the effect of, or rather how quickly does a particular operation take place in hardware or even in software, right? An example of that is supposing I wanted to write a code to find out what is the time required for performing one addition in software, right? One way that I could do this would basically be to have one function that basically says void add and which basically says for i is equal to 1 to let's say 10,000 some large number, I will declare some sum is equal to 0 and then just say sum plus equal to i, some constant value, okay? And what I do is, I then call this function. I start a timing factor over here, call add and stop, right? In other words, the delta time that I find over here should give me the time required for 10,000 addition operations. And by dividing by 10,000, I can get the average time required for one addition. The problem is the compiler will take a look at this entire code, try to figure out what's happening over here. I'm calling this function add, but what happens as a result of add? Nothing. I'm not printing anything out. I'm not changing a value that is seen by the main function. So for all practical purposes, even if I don't do anything in add, it will actually give me the exact same output. This is an example of dead code. The whole thing will just get optimized away, right? And especially while writing hardware or hardware test benches, there could be situations where if you are not careful, you can end up with a scenario where your entire 
module has got optimized away because you did not use the outputs that were being generated. Okay, using the outputs basically means some side effect, print out a value, change some global variable, change something which the compiler cannot automatically assume is going to be part of you know the actual output and therefore can just be optimized away. Okay, so dead code elimination usually doesn't come, dead code doesn't occur by itself but comes up very often as a side effect of other kinds of changes or tests that you are trying to do. Code hoisting is actually related to that sub expression elimination that I spoke about earlier, right? The idea is very simple. If I write the code like this, what will end up happening? How many additions will be performed? This will basically do 100 addition operations. But if I rewrite it like this, this becomes one addition operation, right? So in other words, this is effectively common sub expressions across iterations. It's not that you actually have a separate common sub expression in different parts <coughs> of your code, but across iterations of some for loop, there are common sub expressions that could then be extracted out as a common element over there. This is called code hoisting because you are basically taking something that's present in the code and pulling it out, pulling it up out of the code. Strength reduction, right? This is another sort of class of optimizations rather than a specific optimization by itself. All that it says is, can you reduce the complexity of a certain kind of operation, right? What that means basically is, for example, how would you, is there any other way you can compute y is a y into 4? Huh? You could add 4 times, but unless the processor that you are dealing with is something really old which doesn't have a multiplier at all, it's very likely that 4 additions is more expensive than a multiplication, right? Or you could do shift left by 2, assuming that y is an integer and so on, right? So this operation in most uh, processors and definitely in hardware, right? The shifting is less expensive than multiplication. In hardware, it's obvious. The shifting is essentially, there's no hardware at all involved over there. It's just a case of how you look at the wires. Whereas the multiplication actually requires a hardware multiplier to be put in there and you know, all the associated logic with that. So this is an example where you have taken a uh, an operation and replace it with something that is easier to implement. Similarly, division by 8, right? This could be right shift by 3. Okay, again assuming that t is an integer. Okay. Multiplication by 15, what could you do here? 16 minus 1. Okay, so you could write this as q left shift 4 minus q well, minus q. Okay. Now it's a bit more tricky. It's no longer so obvious that this is actually better than multiplication. And in fact, what you will find is on most modern processors, right? Definitely any Intel or AMD processor that's in a reasonably modern uh, laptop or desktop, this instruction on the right, the shift and subtract is going to take more time than the multiplication. Okay. But in hardware, the instruction on the right is still occupying far less logic than putting a full blown multiplier that is required by the left. Okay. A similar thing that can be done over here is, but a slightly more tricky thing, which is also related to another optimization we'll look at later. Supposing you had something like this, right? You want to do, you have some int c equal to seven and a for loop that basically says y of i is equal to c into i. What can you do over here? It's not very, both C and I are changing, right? So how would you go about 
you can basically add the previous value you keep track of a temporary value over here right and you can basically say y of i is equal to t and then t is equal to t plus 7 right so effectively what you are doing is you are changing the value that you are getting in here so what is it after all that 7 is to be multiplied by the index the loop index right but the loop index is a continuous it's a so called induction variable it is varying continuously 0 1 2 3 and so on so you can calculate its value by addition rather than actually explicitly doing a multiplication once again this is a case where it's a slightly more complicated setup it's no longer that you can just look at the code and straight away say strength reduction but if you understand what is happening over there you can translate this into a strength reduction transformation function inlining right in order to understand why this works you have to look at it from two points of view both from software as well as hardware right in the case of software what will happen is what happens when you call a function it's basically going to be a branch instruction in the assembly language right so you have to save the present variables to stack create new stack space for the new function that's going to be called branch and eventually there will also be a return from the branch okay so in other words if you had something very trivial like this you're just multiplying or squaring a number the overhead that is associated with all of these steps is almost certainly far more than the time required for just computing that value okay but from the point of view of writing code it is still cleaner to write code like this if i can write a function square which will actually just return x into x right that's a nice way of doing it because i can understand what's happening i could also have done this using a macro right a hash define but in some cases macros are a bit clumsy they are not exactly the equivalent of functions right there is a potential for things going wrong because they are just doing some pre-processing they are not really doing compilation and no optimizations over there right what could be done instead is that the compiler basically says look the amount of code inside the function is so small that the effort involved in actually calling the function is more than that required for computing it so i'll just skip that and you know return the value directly okay in terms of hardware a function will get translated into a module which will have a start signal a done <coughs> signal possibly some kind of a ready signal for handshaking and data then needs to be transferred into it and data needs to be transferred out of it okay the moment you have a start signal and a done signal it means you have a finite state machine it means that multiple clock cycles are going to pass just for activating and terminating that function okay so if you actually have a explicit function call that is converted into a hardware module it will mean so many more clock cycles if that function call is somewhere inside a loop that number of clock cycles get multiplied by the number of times that loop is going to execute okay so in both cases if your function is relatively small inlining can be a useful thing to do on the other hand inlining blindly inlining everything is also a bad idea because it actually will end up bloating your code it will make it much larger than it needs to be because every time that you have this f of x it will be replaced by x into x okay in this case of course it's probably you know just as well to do this but if your code was bigger if your function call was bigger every time you had f of x it would replace it with a large piece of code completely increasing the size of what you have in the case of hardware just making it so large making the intermediate netlist so large that it's very likely the compiler will just fail it will run out of memory and not be able to synthesize what you are trying to do okay so what we'll do is we'll stop here for now there are a few other optimizations that are primarily targeted towards loops that we will look at many of these things are 
very directly related to hardware implementation because as we will see in hardware the primary thing that we are going to try and optimize is situations where we have loops those are our primary target of optimization okay so in tomorrow's class we'll look at loop oriented optimizations first from the point of view of software and then start looking at the actual implementation of optimizations in the vivado hls compiler